Welcome back to another video. This is actually part two in a two-part series talking all things panfish. Now in the first video we talked about location and I will link that video down in the description below if you're looking for some location tips. But in this video we're talking about tactics. So as you can see we're set up here in the fish house and we've been fishing for a little bit. We just got done talking location. Now we're gonna talk about how you're gonna catch these fish once you find them. So let's get into the tips. All right, so tip number one, you need to figure out your weapon of choice. So right now, fishing up in shallow weeds, catching bluegills specifically, I have a small little tungsten jig on there. This one is actually the Northland tungsten mud, mud bug in chartreuse color, of course. So anyway, you gotta decide your weapon of choice based on the type of area that you are fishing. So when I'm fishing up in shallow water like this, especially shallow clear water, I'll tend to go with something that's a little bit smaller and more finessey. So tungsten drops faster than lead, which is great, but no matter what you do, if you have a tiny little jig like that, it's gonna take a long time to drop a good ways. So when you're fishing shallow water, these tiny little jigs work super good. But if you're fishing deeper water, you may want to upsize to something that's a little bit bigger. And I actually think I do have a spoon tied on. Like a little, a little vertical spoon like this is going to work really good when you're fishing out in deep basin areas. And uh, it's also, so depth can be really key because fall speed and just overall efficiency like this is going to get down to the bottom in 30 feet way 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 faster than uh, this little guy is so if you're hole hopping trying to stay on top of fish that are moving you're going to want to use a heavier bait so you can just be a lot faster and and chase those fish down um, but another thing that you're definitely going to want to consider is kind of the clarity of the water that you're fishing in so if you're fishing in really clear water, typically what I like to do is be a little bit more subtle and finesse with my presentation. So right now I'm rocking a little tungsten jig. You can see it right there on the screen. And that's just a tiny little profile. And I got a little wax worm on there. And when you look at it, that thing is really more wax worm than it is anything. Um, so when it's really clear and the fish can kind of analyze the bait, that can be key sometimes to have a smaller bait and have that chunk of meat on the back, uh, especially bluegills. Bluegills are very analytical. They're gonna stare that bait down, make sure that it's just right before they come in and take a little snap at it. On the other side of the spectrum, sometimes crappies, you know, if they see anything floating around in the water column, they just come, come through and crack it. You know, they don't generally take a lot of time to kind of figure out if it's something that would be a good idea to bite. They'll just come cruising through and smack it. With crappies specifically, I tend to upsize a little bit more often. That's when, that's when the bigger spoon comes into play because you take a spoon with that treble dangling down at the bottom and you put a few wax worms. Let's say uh, you put one wax worm on each of the trebles and as you can see on the underwater camera right now, like I don't have wax worms on it right now, but the idea remains the same. This bait is a lot bigger. It's gonna draw fish in from a distance because, well, number one, like this is the buckshot spoon, which has the buckshot rattles in it. So a little bit of rattling action is gonna attract those fish in, but also just like this bigger bait moving around in the water column is moving water and the fish can feel it on their lateral line. So that bigger bait is gonna call fish in from a further distance away. So that's why like, Specifically, if I'm fishing in clear bodies of water, um, typically the fish tend to be more sight oriented because they can see really far away. But when it's a little bit muddier, you know, something that's gonna move water or have rattles, um, something that's gonna vibrate, something that's gonna clank is gonna be more effective because the fish are gonna be able to find it a lot easier. And that also tends to be the case as well when you're fishing out in the basin because obviously like, when you're in the basin, there's just a ton of water all over and those fish might be 20 feet this way. And if you have a little tungsten jig, 
you know, in some situations, like the crappies and the bluegills are going to have no problem uh, sensing that jig coming down. Um, it's actually interesting because sometimes, even when you're fishing a tiny little tungsten jig, if there's some fish down at the bottom, they'll start moving up towards that jig uh, once it's like two or three feet below the hole. So they know it's there. If it's muddy or maybe you're fishing at night when it's a little bit darker, sometimes it pays to have that bigger bait down there to kind of call those fish in from a little bit further away. Likewise, if it's dark or dirty water, sometimes I'll go to a glow stick as well. Um, actually, I can dig into my box right now. Kind of got to flick the latches up on this box. You have uh, these guys right here, glow shot spoons. And they actually have like a little glow stick on the inside of it. I don't know how well you can see that on this camera. But uh, that's a really good option when it's a low light period as well. So I guess uh, that was kind of like a long winded way of saying like, depending on the conditions, you're gonna wanna use a different presentation. Um, one thing that I've also really uh, found to be super effective for crappies is uh, these horizontal minnow baits. So this one right here is just kind of your traditional puppet minnow pink. Crappies love pink. These uh, puppet minnows are super good when you're fishing in clear water because they don't have rattles. They're sort of visual, um, but they're also great in basin areas when, uh, you know, when you're popping that bait, it's kind of flying left, flying right all over the place. It's kind of, oops, I accidentally threw it over there. Uh, it's kind of covering like a big area underneath the hole and uh, basins can be quite vast and sometimes it pays to have a little bit of range around your hole. Um, and when it's like really, really dirty water fishing situations, that's when I'm gonna lean on like maybe a lipless crankbait like this, like the Rip and Shad. It's got super loud rattles. And uh, this one's a bright color, which I think is really good in dark, dark water situations as well. So just depends on the lake you're fishing and the conditions that you're fishing. Um, let that kind of guide you as far as what bait you're picking. Now tip number two, I guess tip number one was kind of long-winded, but we're gonna call that one tip. Um, tip number two is kind of along the same lines in its color. Um, so once again, when you're trying to decide what color that you're using, let kind of just the conditions dictate that. So basically like if it's a muddy water situation or I say muddy, but just kind of dark, it could be dingy, it could be nighttime or it could be any of the above. Like I tend to like brighter colors, the pinks, um, chartreuses, stuff like that. Like this is a really, this is a really cool color for dirty water. Um, and then in clear bodies of water, I tend to like colors that are a little bit more natural, kind of like your blues and your purples. Those are a few of my go-tos and anytime that there's like, perch in the system, I love using greens. So it just seems like greens are really difficult to beat in perchy, perchy bodies of water. Same with orange. Obviously orange is a, a pretty perchy color as well. But if there's like Cisco's in the area, for instance, let's see if I can dig out, dig out one of the Wonder Bread spoons. You got a big giant glob of spoons here. But uh, Wonder Bread is like really cool when you're fishing in areas that have minnows or uh, any kind of uh, minnowy forage that's white or silver. So that's kind of how I think about color. I don't think color like matters a ton, but that being said, like I've been in situations where me and my buddy are using the exact same bait and the only difference is color. And you know, maybe we're fishing in a fish house. We're both right next to each other and one guy is out fishing the other. And then as soon as the other guy switches colors to match the guy who's, you know, killing it, that guy, that guy starts catching them too. So uh, color can matter sometimes, but more often than not, it's gonna be like more of a matter of, hey, like, are they biting on spoons or are they biting on hard baits? So that's the way I think about it anyway. Um, and generally, like as a rule of thumb, if the fish are being, like really aggressive, I will tend to go with those bigger baits 
I will go with baits that have rattles, stuff like that. But if they're being kind of like tight lipped, then I'll end up using uh, something that's a little bit more finessey that doesn't have rattles, whether it's like a really small little micro spoon or uh, potentially like a little tungsten or whatnot. That's kind of how I like to think about it. All right, tip number three. A lot of people, they always wanna know like, hey, do you like using meat or do you like using plastics on your jigs and your spoons and all that? And uh, my answer is always like, hey, I love to use plastics when I can get away with it, but never, ever, ever, oh, looks like I spilt. Never, ever leave home without the wax worms. Um, because if you show up and they're not eating plastics, you're gonna be very disappointed. And like a little cartridge of waxies like this is uh, dirt cheap, like it's a dollar and change. And uh, you don't wanna have like your day ruined because you couldn't get any of those fish to bite because they were being super picky and didn't wanna snap your bait when in reality, like maybe if you had some meat on the end of your bait instead of plastic, you'd have got some bites. So I always bring both if you can get away with it like I love to catch them on plastics and the reason for that is uh, because you can just be a lot more efficient if you're hole hopping and it's really cold out you don't have to worry about taking off your gloves and rebaiting that's really nice but also when the bite is just super hot and heavy if you hook up with the fish more often than not your plastic is gonna be fine you could catch you know 10 15 fish on one plastic if it's a good hardy plastic that's rigged on properly. Um, so just efficiency when the bite is really hot. One thing you'll notice, you know, we're kind of, we're getting close to that evening bite right now. Um, but one thing that you will definitely notice is uh, when those fish come in in the evening, they come in in droves and there can be a bunch of fish and the very, very best bite window might only be like 30 minutes or 40 minutes and you really want to capitalize on that bite window and using plastics is just your best option for once you hook a fish you uh reel it up land it unhook it let it go and then get ooh. speaking of fish there we go that's a good one that's a good one oh yeah you want to get right back down there when there's a bunch of fish right now obviously there's only one fish oh that's a good blue kill right there Ooh. let's unhook him quick that one was actually snagged on the side of the body he didn't even bite you probably saw that on the underwater camera but uh that is a nice bluegill right there that is awesome oh do you see that pike in the background right now too how cool is that all right let's get him back in the water so that's just like a great example. I talked about it a little bit in the last video when I was um, talking more on location and different bite windows and whatnot, how some of the bigger bluegills will come in during the low light period. And uh, you know, you might catch the smaller ones or the moderate size ones all day, but ooh, there's a pike. I kind of uh, wouldn't mind catching this guy too, just for the fun of it. Although I think any like panfish purist is gonna say, no, thank you. But it's kind of cool to get some strikes on the underwater camera, right? Here he comes. And also, I like to hook him, get him out of here. So I guess this is kind of a good opportunity to uh, segue into the next tip. And that is never stop jigging your bait. This is obviously a pike, but um, it's even more important when you're when you're doing a uh, panfish, like if you stop jigging your bait like that, oftentimes the fish is gonna lose interest just like this pike is losing interest, right on cue. <laughs> um, but also like more often than not, especially if you're using a spinning reel, that line is probably gonna be a little bit more twisted and uh, your bait is gonna slowly rotate in a circle if you're not jigging it actively enough. That's one thing. You can always look down your hole, check to see like, if I jig it this much, is my bait kind of staying straight or is it spinning in a circle? Cause maybe, you know, your wax worm is kind of, is kind of rigged on there, kind of cockeyed or something like that. So uh, basically what I'm getting at is like, Q 
keep that bait jigging at all times because if there's one thing that panfish absolutely hate, it's when uh, your bait is spinning in a circle. And it also makes it a little bit harder for them to kind of like key in on that wax worm because if they bite the head of uh, your jig, you're obviously not gonna have a very good hooking percentage unless they take the whole jig into its mouth. And more often than not, especially when you're, when you're talking, oh look, my wax worm fell off. Um, more often than not, when you're talking about bluegills, they're just gonna come in and they're gonna peck it like that. And so they're either gonna get the head or they're gonna get the tail. They usually don't get all of it on the first woof. When crappies come through, they'll come through and absolutely just smash and annihilate everything and take it all into their big giant paper mouth. So it becomes less of an issue in that situation. But when you're chasing bluegills, you want things to be consistent. You don't want it spinning. And uh, that's my two cents on it. So I guess I can wrap up the uh, plastics versus meat argument. I guess what I was getting at is during like the low light period, which we're in right now, and you'll notice I'm using meat. Um, but with that being said, like if there were a lot more fish underneath my hole right here, I would definitely be running plastics because basically like you wanna be as efficient as possible. And I guess touching really quickly on the topic of what is the best live bait option. If I'm chasing crappies, I think sometimes it can just be really, really difficult to beat a good old fashioned crappie minnow, either on like a small little uh, spoon or a small jig or just a plain hook with a split shot above it. Um, sometimes it's just tough to beat a minnow. That said, if you wanna actively jig them, I think you can't go wrong with either a wax worm or a little Euro larva. Um, but with that being said, I tend to prefer, now I'm getting distracted by what looks to be a big bluegill. <laughs> Well, maybe not. It looks like an okay bluegill. Um, the reason why I tend to prefer waxworms is because I think you get a, a few more bites with them. And then once something does bite that waxworm, those juices spray all over the place and it attracts more fish in. And uh, now, as you can see, a few fish came into the area, which I think is gonna bode well for us, but that's also a time when it's nice to have plastics. But if they're gonna be a little hesitant like this, then also you know that uh, meat is gonna just get you a few more bites. Um, but one thing that I have noticed is that spikes tend to be like spikes. I say spikes, some of you might not know what that means. That's uh, the little red Euro larva. Those tend to be like a happy medium between waxworms and plastics because they're a lot more durable and you can put a bunch of them on your hook. So that's just my personal opinion. I have been able to get more bites when I'm using wax worms versus larva. Um, but larva is a little bit more durable. You can catch more fish with them. Um, and when the bite is hot and heavy, it pays to have something that stays on the hook a little bit better. So uh, that's how I tend to strategize with it. But the wax worms are great because they got all that juice. And uh, when a fish does bite it, they tend to like, like let's say they do like a short bite. If you rip off the tip of the worm, which I like to do, um, the tip that's pointed away from the jig, when they bite onto that worm, that juice is gonna shoot right into their mouth and they're gonna choke up and take another bite on that jig because it was so delicious. So uh, nasty worms apparently are delicious to fish. So anyway, that's kind of uh, my two cents. I, I think the wax worms end up getting a little bit of a higher hooking percentage with bluegills for that exact reason. There we are. And there's a pike on me. Not good. It's a little one too. Look how tiny that little bugger looks. He's gonna bite. Got him. All right. Probably gonna have to reset my camera again if I don't get this guy up to the hole fast. Oop, and there goes the line. Look at him, you can see him fighting on the camera. Cool, that means he's not tangled in the camera. <laughs> All right, let's get him up here. If I can get away with not losing my jig, that would be like so amazing. He's right there. Ugh. Got him. 
more importantly, I got my jig. My jig is safely on top of the ice now. So one thing that I will recommend if you do see a pike down there, if you can anticipate the bite and get him before he swallows it, you, it's uh, kind of optimal. Cause as you can see, I got him hooked to like right there on the tip of the lip. He was never going to use his sharp little teeth to bite, to bite my line. So that is uh, one tip that I'll give you if you're dealing with pike. And now that I caught him, like I got him up above the ice. He fought for a while. He's kind of freaked out. He's definitely going to leave us alone. And uh, we're getting close to the evening bite here. So that's going to be good that he's going to leave us alone because we don't want him scaring off the bluegills. All right, so let's jump into the next tip. I think number four. If that's wrong, uh, it's going to be a little embarrassing, but anyway, I swear I can count. So anyway, the next tip is make sure your bait is like rigged up really well before you even drop it down there. Um, so a couple tips I'll give you right now is make sure that your bait is, or make sure uh, the meat, so if you got a worm or maybe you're using a plastic or whatever it is, make sure it's on there extremely straight. Um, with uh, plastics, that literally means like rigging it up straight so it's not sticking sideways one way or the other. If it is, when you jig it, that bait is gonna spin around in a circle. Um, and when you're talking about worms, that means like putting the hook directly in the middle of the worm and not more on one side or the other. Because once again, that bait is gonna spin around when you jig it. So get it straight. With these wax worms, I like to uh, rig it on uh, one side of the worm, not the side with the little black head spot, whatever whatever it is. Um, and then I like to pull that black spot right off. So when the fish bites it, it's gonna shoot juice kind of out either into, uh, into the water or into their mouth. So that's kind of my thought process with that. And another important thing is just like, whenever you rig up, just make sure your line is okay. So I just caught a pike and I just basically put my put the line between my fingers and just feel if there's any nicks in the line and if it's in good shape then uh it's not going to snap but if you do feel like little nicks then you're going to want to retie that's very important and then another tip is you're going to want your knot placement to be pointing towards the back of the jig so as you can see i'm holding the jig like this and i take my rod tip and i pull it in this direction so the line is pulling towards the back end of the jig and what that's going to do is it's going to make that jig sit a lot more horizontally especially once you get it in the water and gravity isn't uh, pulling the back end down this thing is going to sit perfectly flat so if i drop that into the water right now you will see right there it's very very flat and it's getting a little dark so it's getting a little tougher to see down there but like anytime you catch a fish or uh Anytime something pulls on the back end of your hook, it's going to end up pulling it down like this so that it's going to be uh, hanging like that. And that's just not a good, not a good presentation. Um, just as a general rule of thumb, you want your bait to be horizontal. Even if you're using a vertical jig with one of those hooks down at the bottom, you want your plastic or your bait to be pointing horizontally. So when I'm using one of these tungsten jigs, I will pull the uh, knot back towards the back end of the hook and I'll put it down. And that's kind of like just a good like overview of how to make sure that your bait is completely dialed before you put it down there. Because if something is wrong with your presentation, a picky bluegill is not gonna eat your bait. Uh, they just won't. So um, same with crappie in some cases when the crappies are being a little more finicky. Um, you need to have your bait looking good for them. And another thing I will add to, add to that too, is when you get in the low light periods, or if you're fishing in deeper water, sometimes glowing up your jig before you put it down can be really critical. I personally have never like really messed around with different scents and stuff like that. I've heard people swear by uh, different uh, scents you can dip your bait in or spray on your bait. I've never done that, but I have seen firsthand how glowing up your jig can be really critical during the low light periods. All right, so things are starting to get a little bit darker. We're getting to that low light period right now. So for tip number five, I'm going to uh, do it really quickly because it includes the underwater camera here. So 
Um, I'm just gonna talk a little bit how I like to work these baits. So right now I've got a little jig and basically I'm just popping it like this. As you can see, it's really simple. I'm just popping it, just working it, never stopping, um, just keeping it moving. And yeah, I don't know what else to say about it. This is how I work a jig. Um, if there is a fish that's coming in, obviously like if I'm using an underwater camera, I like to keep them on camera so I can show you guys the strikes and whatnot. But as a general rule of thumb, when a fish comes in, I am going to slowly raise that bait like this. And as you can see, it's off camera now, but that is generally the idea. And if they don't like the slow raise, I might wiggle it in place kind of at the top of, at the top of my rise and then I'll just slowly jig it back down. And some days the fish are gonna want it a little bit more aggressively jigged. Other days they're just gonna want a super finessey little wiggle like this. So you just kind of have to play with it and see what the fish want. Um, but that's generally how I'm fishing jigs. And jigs are my favorite, favorite bait to use um, when I'm chasing any kind of panfish because it just seems like no matter what the bite is, whether it's hot, whether it's cold, whether it's somewhere in between, uh, a fish is gonna be more likely to want to bite a jig than just about anything. Um, so I'm gonna be real quick, we're losing light, like I said. When I am using spoons, and I don't use a lot of spoons for bluegills, but you could use them, um, but I use spoons a lot for crappies. So I'll get that guy down, and there he is. So with the spoon, I'm gonna fish it a lot more aggressively. So I'm gonna be popping it like this. I'm gonna be trying to make a lot of noise, attract fish in, I'm gonna make a lot of noise and move water. And uh, yeah, as you can see on the screen, like this is pretty much what I'm doing. And just for comparison's sake, like this is what the rod tip looks like when I'm doing this. So typically, obviously, I'm gonna tip these spoons with some sort of meat, but that's how I'm gonna work them. And then when I finally see a fish, I'm just gonna kinda shake it in place like this. And when there actually is meat on the bottom of it, you'll see that that treble hook will kinda pendulum a little bit underneath the uh, spoon. But that's kinda what I'm doing and I can work it in the upward motion kinda like I do with the jig and that tends to work. So that's kind of how I'm working a spoon. And usually with a spoon, I'm gonna work it a little bit higher up off the bottom because that's just uh, gonna be a better recipe for attracting fish in from a distance. And another bait that I'm using all the time is the puppet minnow, specifically for crappies. Again, I don't like to use it for bluegills as much. With bluegills, I tend to go with the micro presentation. Um, but if I'm using, like, basically if I am using a puppet minnow or some sort of lipless crankbait, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, well, I can use the rod tip here. <laughs> What I'm gonna do is I'm kind of gonna pump it up about a foot or so, and I'm gonna let it glide back down, pump it up a foot or so, let it glide back down, maybe maybe give it a double pop to kind of shoot it this way and shoot it that way. Um, but that's kind of gonna be my presentation, and when I am marking a fish, I'm gonna slow that presentation down and give that crappie a chance to come in and uh, grab the treble hook that has some meat dangling on the bottom of it. So presentation wise, that's kind of like a little overview of how I like to do it. And uh, there's a lot of different baits that I like to experiment with and, and try, try new things with. And I actually, when I was doing that 30 day fishing challenge, I actually went out and uh, for basin crappies, I tried to catch fish on 10 different lures. And I actually ended up pulling it off, which was pretty neat. But it kind of just goes to show you that a hungry crappie will bite just about anything that you put down there. And also one thing that I noticed is that the fish ended up being a lot more aggressive when they saw something that was completely new. So you hear people talk about like, oh, you know, I had my little chartreuse jig down there and they didn't want it. And I switched to a red jig and dropped it down there. And man, it just turns out they wanted red instead. And uh, sometimes like, Maybe that's true. Maybe they were preferring red on that particular day. But uh, other times the fish just like seeing something totally different. If they were just staring at your little jig, if you drop a spoon down there, like they're gonna be like, hey, what the heck is that? 
and they might come in and snap it. So just something to think about on the uh, presentation side, but that's how I'm working it. One thing that you'll notice with all these different baits is the fact that I'm being a little bit more aggressive when there aren't any fish around. And uh, once there are fish around, I'm gonna be slowing things down, being a little bit more subtle for two reasons. Number one, when you're more subtle, I think the fish are a little bit more likely to bite your bait. But number two, when they do decide to bite your bait, they also are gonna have a lot better uh, hooking percentage <laughs> as far as if you're going all over the place, they might have a hard time grabbing that bait because you're being too wild. But if you're slowing it down nice and slow, it's pretty low probability chance that they're gonna end up missing that bait completely. So that's something else to think about as well. All right, so I popped on the light, shined a little light on this situation so I could wrap this video up. Um, I guess before I do wrap it up, I should talk a little bit about the uh, rod reel line situation. With panfish, like for me, it's really simple. I like to use fluorocarbon line. And the reason why is I don't feel like it has quite as much memory as uh, monofilament. And also I love the fact that it sinks. So when I'm using tiny little tungsten jigs like this, um, it can be really key to have a line that sinks because you're just gonna have a straighter line. And I could go really deep into this topic, but I'm gonna try and keep it fairly simple because this video is already getting plenty long. Um, so two pound fluorocarbon is my go-to, especially for bluegills. I like to maybe sometimes do uh, three pound when I'm chasing crappies. And uh, more specifically when I'm using bigger baits, that's when three pound tends to be a lot more critical. So, uh, you know, I'm talking like the puppet minnows and uh, other hard baits, other spoons. That's when I'm upsizing to three pound, but two pound is gonna be my go-to for, for jigs and stuff like that. And you can actually get away with two pound um, with some of those bigger baits too. It's a lot tougher than you think it is. Um, and I can actually lift up pretty big, uh, pretty big bluegills and crappies with the two pound test and not have to like grab it down underneath the hole. So that's kind of my uh, thought process on line. And another thing that's really critical on the uh, topic of line is just making sure that you're using a good strong knot that's not gonna slide as much. You know, if you're using a standard fisherman knot, it's going to slide quite a bit when you hook up to a fish. So a Palomar knot has uh, twice as much hold onto the line tie. So when you straighten that jig out, it's gonna stay a lot more straight. And Palomar knots are also just a lot stronger overall. So you're less likely to have knot failure. So knots are very important. And then on like the rod side of things, there's basically two categories of rods. You have your spring bobber rods. And I like spring bobbers when I'm using like small tungsten jigs, cause I just feel like your bite detection is a little bit better. And uh, with that being said, more and more I'm using some of these just like super light tips and uh, that tends to work really well too but there's nothing that's gonna be more sensitive than a spring bobber especially a spring bobber that you can tune up or down and uh, adjust the sensitivity of based on the weight of the uh, jig that you're using you obviously don't you want to use a spring bobber rod when you're fishing like bigger baits like spoons and whatnot that's where a longer, heavier, soft tip is gonna be a lot more effective. And uh, I guess before I set this rod down, another big question people always have is, you know, what type of reel do you use and why? And so for me, spinning reels work great for hard baits, for uh, spoons, for puppet minnows, stuff like that. But when I'm using small little tungsten jigs, the inline reel is gonna be a lot better choice overall. Um, one negative to the inline reel is the fact that uh, if you're not careful, like you can create a huge mess with the line going underneath the reel. And uh, they're not like super high end, like nobody makes one that's just like crazy, crazy good with perfect drag and like a great line management system. Um, there's some okay ones on the market, but all in all, they're not gonna be as good. Um, and the drag is not gonna be quite as good either. Um, but with that being said, like, you can land like a big pike or a big bass on an inline reel if you know how to use it. So um, for me, the inline reels are better because you get 
much, much, much less line twist. Anybody says that anybody that says there's going to be no line twist um, doesn't know what they're talking about. They're just talking and uh, basically going over talking points. But uh, there's going to be some line twist because when you're dropping that bait down, if you look, that bait's going to be spinning uh, if it's not rigged completely straight. And even if it's, you know, just like 1% off, it's going to spin a little bit as it goes down. And uh, in some cases, like your bait is going to spin while you're jigging it. You know, if you're down in 20 feet of water, you can't see what your bait is doing down there. It might be spinning. So there's going to be some line twists, but inline reels minimize most of it. Because uh, these spinning reels just coil up like crazy. Like they're basically designed to make line twists, which doesn't, as matter, doesn't matter as much when you're using hard baits. But when you're using small tungsten baits, you want to be extremely, extremely uh, cognizant of your line management. And that's why I like to use inline reels when I'm using tungstens. After hours, bluegill. Ooh, actually, it's not a bluegill. It's a little pumpkin. Well, you probably can't see it when I hold it like that. Let's see if I can hold it the pro way. There we go. How gorgeous is that fish? Beautiful. Cool. And uh, it's getting pretty darn dark here. Not uh, super easy to see on the underwater camera, but you could see that fish come in. But it was actually like difficult to even ID the species down there. Like I actually, for a minute there, thought it was a crappie, which in theory, the crappie should be showing up at some point here. <laughs> so uh, anyway. All right, so that is a big bunch of tips that I think you'll be able to use out on the ice this year and hopefully catch some more fish. and. It's like there's a good shadow coming down from, from the light on top. But it's starting to get dark here. We're starting to get to prime time. I'm going to fish a little bit more. May or may not put it on in the, uh, in the video. But anyway, I'm going to call this video right here. I want to thank you guys all for watching. If you missed the first video in this series, I'll put it right here. And I talk a little bit more about location. This video was more about presentation. But uh, check that video out if you want some location info. And I want to thank you for watching and I will see you in the next one.